Okay, good evening. Here we are, ready for some more liberal lies, or, well, lies about history. I still don't quite think they're all liberal lies, but anyway, let's get into it. Um, we've got a couple of short ones, so we'll do th three, possibly four tonight. We are on, we're starting off with lie number 24, so we're at the halfway point as of this one, or at the end of this one. So, here we go. So, lie number 24 about American history is, Abraham Lincoln only freed the slaves to beef up his troop strength. I have never heard that so-called lie um, a lot of these I've never heard of, so I don't know. This guy thinks they're lies. Anyway, so we start off with three, um, quotes again, as usual. The first one, with the Emancipation Proclamation, the Union Army was open to blacks, and the more blacks entered the war, the more it appeared a war for their liberation. That is by Howard Zinn, A People's History of the United States. The second one, Abraham Lincoln's dream, like Jefferson's dream, was a dream of a lily-white America without Negroes, Native Americans, and Martin Luther Kings. That's Larone Bennett Jr. forced into glory. And the third is, another consideration was the potential value of black soldiers. If the North could tap this human reservoir, it could offset the immense losses on the battlefields and the declining zeal of white volunteers. And that is by Erwin Unger, These United States. Okay, so here we go. As is clear from the quotations, in the wacky world of the new left, Abraham Lincoln was a racist. According to some, he only issued the Emancipation Proclamation because he needed more bodies for his war machine. Yet for others, such as Bennett, Lincoln was so race-minded that he never intended to use black troops in battle because, according to the Lincoln as racist view, black troops were incompetent in his mind. Yet even generally sober treatments such as The Great Republic by Bernard Balin et al., whose section on the Civil War was written by the esteemed David Donald, linked emancipation to the military's need for more black troops. Donald's four-page discussion about the proclamation is built around the premise of military necessity. For leftist historians, the entire Civil War was, has always been a problem because it demonstrated unequivocally, unequivocally that Americans would fight for their ideas. It is absolutely true, as demonstrated in lie number 39, that the Civil War was ultimately caused by slavery and little else, that the value of slave property was the elephant in the room, quote unquote, of antebellum politics, and that some Southerners occasionally admitted as such, as much. It is equally true, however, that the large majority of Southerners did not own slaves and did not particularly care for the elites who did, but they had been born and raised in a culture that emphasized both states' rights. What? Oh, okay. States' rights, that's a quote. And constitutional liberties, including, if one chose and had the money, the right to own a slave. In the movie Gettysburg, when a captured Confederate is asked why he and his comrades are fighting, he replies, We're fighting for our rights. Quote, unquote. The questioner soon realizes he said they were fighting for their rights. Quote, Why are you fighting in this war? End quote. Union troops asked a captured soldier, quote, Because you're down here, he replied. End quote. But in fact, the only right at issue was the right to hold other humans as chattel. It was equally true of northern soldiers. Most believed in the cause of the Union, and they wanted to, quote-unquote, teach the South a lesson, namely that no state or states could flaunt the Constitution by seceding. But just as southerners 
deep down knew that the underlying issue was slavery, so too in the North most realized that sooner or later they would have to do something about the slaves. This became obvious immediately the first time Union soldiers took in former slaves. What were they? Slaves? Free men? In 1861, when Brigadier General Benjamin Beast Butler took custody of slaves who had escaped from the next county, he refused to return them, ultimately declaring them, quote-unquote, contraband of war. Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells issued a directive in September 1861 that gave, quote, per persons of color commonly known as contrabands, end quote, who were employed by the Union Navy pay of $10 a month and rations. The Union Army soon followed suit and again used the term contrabands. Moreover, the Confiscation Act of 1861 made liable for confiscation any property, including slaves, that the Confederates employed for military use. The 1862 Act prohibiting the return of slaves further cemented the non-slave status of contraband blacks. Already then, Abraham Lincoln's original war aim of restoring the Union was de facto broadened. While he hoped to start with the loyal border states, e.g. Kentucky, Missouri, and Maryland, and spread emancipation downward, after a July 1862 meeting with border state representatives, he realized he had it backward. Emancipation had to start with the states in rebellion, then spread back northward to the loyalist states. Never in these discussions with any of the border state representatives or with Lincoln's own cabinet were considerations of black soldiers raised. For Lincoln, this issue was always about winning, and winning in such a way that a permanent peace in the United Nation resulted. A day after meeting with the border state representatives, Lincoln took a carriage ride with William Seward, his Secretary of State, and Navy Secretary Wells. He told them in an urgent voice, quote unquote, that the time had passed for an amicable reunion of the warring sections, and instead the North needed to focus on the, quote unquote, heart of the rebellion namely the institution of slavery that had caused secession in the first place. As Michael Allen and I wrote in A Patriot's History of the United States, quote, it is critical that an understanding of emancipation began begin with Lincoln's perception that slavery was first and foremost a moral and legal issue, not a military or political one, end quote. Lincoln's writings repeatedly cited moral and social, never military, reasons for emancipation. Quote, I never in my life was more certain that I was doing right than in, than in signing the Emancipation Proclamation, end quote. Lincoln said, uh, more germane to the argument of whether Lincoln merely acted out of the need for more soldiers is the timing. While the North had lost many battles already, indeed, Lincoln could not issue any proclamation about emancipation without a military victory first. Lincoln had already made up his mind on emancipation by the summer of 1862. The North had indeed suffered several defeats, first Bull Run and the Battle of the Wilderness, but had yet to experience the truly heavy casualty counts of Ant Antietam, Fredericksburg, or Gettysburg. Moreover, a little known fact is that in every major battle of the first two years, except Fredericksburg, the South suffered a higher percentage of troop loss as a share of troops committed than did any Union general. Robert E. Lee, for all his purported military genius, suffered 20% casualties while inflicting only 15% on his enemy, while Grant suffered 18% casualties, but inflicted 30% losses on his foes. According to Grady McQuinney, the Confederacy lost a higher percentage of men committed to 11 of the first 12 battles or campaigns than did the Union because of its aggressive attack-and-die tactics. Okay. 
Far from gaining troops, the proclamation was almost as likely to cost the Union recruits. Illinois regiments, for example, suffered the largest number of desertions immediately after the proclamation was issued, and one regiment, the 109th, had to be disbanded for disloyalty. A lieutenant in the 86th Illinois Regiment found only eight men in his company who approved of the proclamation. No commentator even mentioned the possibility of blacks replacing whites at the front. Instead, they worried about, quote, the lusts of freed Negroes who will overrun our country, end quote. Lerone Bennett, a Lincoln hater of the first degree, ironically ignored the premise that Lincoln freed the slaves to obtain more soldiers. Quite the contrary. Bennett maintained that the Emancipation Proclamation was intended to re-enslave blacks. Such fantasies only operate in the nether universe of the uber-liberals and black racists. But this creates a stunning problem. If northern whites were such blatant racists, as Larone insists, then it was inconceivable that they would ever use blacks as soldiers. Surprisingly to some, over a 100,000 southern supporters of the Union effort fought against the Confederacy, including entire regiments from Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, plus 40,000 Tennesseans. African Americans made up about 10% of the Union Army, 179,000, and another 19,000 served in the Navy. In fact, recruitment was slow at first, until Frederick Douglass worked to convince blacks to join the Union forces. It is true that some white officers did not think black soldiers could fight, but they learned differently after African American units were finally put into combat. Still, the very fact that there was reluctance to use black troops in combat further undercuts the view that emancipation was only a vehicle to get more soldiers. Many of the earliest black recruits were volunteers from South Carolina and Tennessee. After being relegated to supply and guard details, their constant lobbying for a hand in the fighting finally resulted in black units being used in combat alongside whites. Far from being an easy choice for Lincoln and his war cabinet, inserting colored troops into an all-white corps could easily have eroded large unit cohesion and even raised the possibility that white troops might not support their black compatriots at critical points on the battlefield. As with anything else they did, blacks had to fight to prove they belonged in the army. Contrary to the depiction in the film Glory, the first use of African American soldiers in combat came in October 1862 when the first Kansas colored volunteers beat back Confederate attacks at the Battle of Island Mound, Missouri. Although I have to say, Glory is a great movie. <laughs> uh, several months later, black troops advanced across open ground to attack Confederate positions at Port Hudson, Louisiana. Although the assault failed, the courage of the troops convinced white officers and enlisted men alike that blacks would and could fight well. Union black troops gained their greatest success at the Battle of New Market Heights in Virginia, September 1864. African-American troops served gallantly, taking 40,000 casualties and earning 16 Medals of Honor. Not until June of 1864 did Congress finally equalize the pay of U.S. colored troops with that of whites. A largely forgotten fact of the Civil War is that a large number of free blacks and slaves served in the Confederate Army with slaves promised their freedom in exchange for service. Some fought because the South was their home, even if as slaves. Most were never permitted to have weapons and were largely confined to physical labor, cooking, and digging. A handful did actually see combat, combat however. While the view that the Emancipation Proclamation was primarily oriented toward adding black soldiers to the Union Army has receded in recent years, confined mainly to demagogues such as Bennett, it is noteworthy that Bernard Balin's book, The Great Republic, coupled emancipation with the need for black troops.
Likewise, to show how such ideas insinuate themselves into even conservative common sense teaching, one only has to look at the influential homeschool website, Family Education, which implies that the union was running out of men. It is true that more soldiers were being used in guard duty as the North advanced into the Confederacy, but blacks were demanding to be combat soldiers, not guards. Moreover, as normalcy returned to Confederate states long in Union possession, Louisiana, parts of Tennessee, white troops could be rotated out. Although addressing Congress's July 1862 legislation that authorized freedom for any Southern slave who escaped and joined Union forces, not Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, the site's author nevertheless argues that Congress, quote, acted not out of ethical considerations primarily, but from sheer military necessity. The Union needed more troops, end quote. Again, the fact was that the high casualty battles of Ant Antietam and Fredericksburg had not been fought yet, that the Army of the Potomac, especially constantly outnumbered by the Army of Northern Virginia, and that many were convinced that all the Union Army needed was a general who would fight. Stating the obvious, in the summer of 1862, when Lincoln had already decided emancipation had to be the war aim, few in the North thought that the difficulty in defeating the South lay in insufficient troop numbers. General George B. McClellan, who constantly complained about not having a large enough troop advantage, nevertheless always outnumbered Lee, and at Antietam even had Lee's full battle plans. After intercepting Special Order No. 191, McClellan reportedly exclaimed, quote, Here is a paper with which, if I cannot whip Bobby Lee, I will be willing to go home, end quote. While McClellan did not whip Robert E. Lee, once again the Union exacted a far higher cost from the Confederates in casualties as a percentage of men committed to the fight than the Union paid. Whether the Union knew it or not, with or without African American soldiers, the South was losing proportionally more in every exchange than was the North. While black soldiers did contribute to the victory, just as state militias and draftees and countless white volunteers did, it was only a matter of time before the North settled on a general who could fight skillfully and bring the North's industrial dominance to bear. Ultimately, it was Ulysses S. Grant and the overwhelming output of northern factories, not black troops, that turned the tide of war. And that is the end of number 24. So that puts us at exactly the halfway point in the book as far as the number of lies. Lie number 25. The Scopes trial proved that Darwin was correct and Christians were backward. I'm not sure I'm going to agree with this one. Um, not that I completely disagree either. All right, so we start off with three quotes again. So first one, shortly after the trial ended, Brian died and the movement for anti-evolution laws disintegrated. Fundamentalists retreated for many years from battles over public education. That is by Eric Fauner, Give Me Liberty. The second one is, the judge found Scopes guilty, but the fundamentalist crusade no longer had the same force. That is by Samuel Eliot Morrison et al., A Concise History of the American Republic. And the third one, after Dayton, the fundamentalists, their fury spent for the moment, went dormant. And that was George Brown Tyndall and David E. Shee, America, A Narrative History. All right, so here we go. It's no surprise that textbook authors cleverly arrange the Scopes trial before or immediately after such social maladies as the Ku Klux Klan, Eric Fauner, or Al Capone, Tyndall and She. In Morrison and Comager's A Concise History of the American Republic, the trial falls under the heading, quote, 19th century America's last stand, end quote. Harold et al.'s 
unto a good land presents scopes immediately prior to quote nativist fear and immigration restrictions end quote and opposite a spooky looking picture of evangelist amy semple mcpherson sporting a clan type robe with her hands outstretched and eyes uplifted surprisingly only daniel godfield whose american journey is reliably leftist on almost all other issues correctly described the scene in which quote millions of americans tuned their radios to hear the first trial ever broadcast and in which the fundamentalists suffered republic uh, suffered public ridicule from reporters including h l mencken who sneered at the hillbillies and yokels of dayton tennessee end quote to the extent that americans know anything at all of, of the scopes trial it usually comes from brief descriptions from textbooks as noted in the epigraphs to this chapter or more likely from the famous book the movie inherit the wind and movie inherit the wind with spencer tracy and a young gene kelly the famous movie scene indeed had drama lawyer henry drummond played by tracy in the film represents the teacher bertram gate cates played by dick york unjustly accused of teaching evolution drummond cross-examines matthew harrison brady played by frederick march but representing william jennings bryan exposing him as an ignorant bumpkin but as historian burton folsom jr notes quote the problem is that the historians playwrights and filmmakers have told the story wrong end quote typically textbooks conclude concluded that quote brian appeared grossly misinformed about modern science end quote yet the trial record showed just the opposite that he was better read on archaeology and anthropology than was clarence darrow inherit the wind oh i've seen i have seen that play okay at a high school um, scope's significance in history is that it addressed two central questions of a modern society namely the origins of man and the propriety of teaching values in public schools it was also a particularly useful target for social crit critics because the battle lines were so sharply drawn with brian and the hick bible thumpers quote unquote on one side and the sophisticated intellectual elites represented by darrow on the other one text nation of nations described the trial as a quote-unquote national joke a characterization neither darrow nor brian would have accepted tennessee state law prohibited the teaching of evolution in public schools specifically it should be noted the teaching of evolution from biology textbooks that presented it as a fact instead of a viable theory yet the famous darrow cross-examination of brian was irrelevant to the main points of either attorney although it was the last major event at the trial it was natural then that writers would make this exchange the climax of their dramas often missed in the cross-examination is why it was necessary in the first place darrow was losing the judge had already ruled that evolution was a theory and that scientists opinions were just that opinions sorry just checking my temperatures here okay um darrow also tried to show that evolution was compatible with the bible but had to discard that after brian's major speech instead brian tried to make the trial about brian rather than john scopes both men had reputations for their speaking skills but darrow's was in debate while brian's was in stemwinder stemwinder winder speeches i've never heard that term uh, since brian already had the case won he could have declined to appear as a witness for the defense and he was completely aware that he was leaving his own home turf and entering darrow's domain brian had himself used the 
quote-unquote cross-examiner's advantage many times to pick apart answers with more questions designed to make the witness contradict himself so he knew what he faced. Brian became overconfident on the basis of his earlier one-on-one -on -one victories over Darrow in the case, and he was apparently he also apparently believed he would have the opportunity to interrogate Darrow, making it even. Up to that time, Brian had addressed Darrow, quoting Darwin to Darrow, and even quoting Darrow to Darrow. But Darrow was deceptive, citing the non-existent book of Elijah in the Bible, and also earlier, a non-existent book of Buddha. Quote unquote. While the movies and books have made great hay out of Brian's silly line, quote, I do not think about things I do not think about, end quote. They have ignored some of the repartee where Brian got the best of Darrow. When Brian said Buddhism is an agnostic religion, quote unquote, Darrow said, quote, what do you mean by agnostic, end quote. And Brian answered, I don't know, end quote unquote. Darrow thought he said Brian. Darrow thought he had Brian. Quote, you don't know what you mean, end quote. Brian answered correctly, quote, that is what agnosticism is. I don't know, end quote. <laughs> that was fairly clever. Darrow also stumbled into a discussion of Confucianism, Confucianism that is routinely ignored. Unaware that Brian had been to China and written two books on Chinese culture and religion, Brian used Confucianism to show the distinct difference between it and Christianity, forcing Darrow to retreat along different lines. When Darrow tried to expose Brian as ignorant by asking him how many people were on earth at the beginning of the Christian era, Brian said he didn't know then challenged Darrow to provide the information, which he couldn't, because he didn't know it either. When Darrow asked if Brian had, quote, any idea how old the Egyptian civilization was, end quote, Brian merely answered no. But he, not Darrow, had been to Egypt, read hieroglyphics, and had traveled the Nile. In the 12-day 12 12 day trial that defined the term, quote-unquote, media circus, more than 100 reporters descended on the small Tennessee town. Folsom was, has argued that, quote, the intellectual community, especially the urban media, did indeed oppose Brian strongly, end quote. And most of the reporters opposed him. Some were honest. Henry Hyde of the Baltimore Sun wrote that, quote, the great crowd was plainly sympathetic toward Brian and roared its approval as he countered the Darrow questions, end quote. As Folsom concluded Darrow, Darrow with, quote unquote, little knowledge of evolution and less of the Bible, went up to a celebrated witness and asked him impossible questions that no one could answer and got away with it, end quote. The big city papers, for the most part, took Darrow's side, even though Scopes lost. Headlines heralded Quote, Tennessee versus truth, end quote, the nation. Um, Tennessee versus civilization, New Republic. Thought, free or in chains, school and society. Inquisition in Tennessee, forum. And foreign amazement in Tennessee, literary digest. The New York Times praised Darrow's, quote, rationalism, his utterances and his courage, end quote, while the nation called him, quote, an enlightened man, end quote. Novels such as Elmer Gantry and Tieftallow lambasted evangelists as phonies and anti-evolutionists as shallow and corrupt. But in a stunning ex expose, Burton Folsom discovered that illiteracy was more correlated with those who favored evolution teaching. Major anti-evolutionists were well-educated people. Half of the North Carolina legislature that voted for an anti-evolution law had college degrees. 
all four doctors in the North Carolina House voted against evolution. Many of the famous preachers, including Amy Semple McPherson, William Bell Riley, and J. Frank Norris, were hardly uneducated country hicks. They all had large urban co congregations. The case was eventually thrown out in the appeal process on a technicality that the jury, not the judge, should have set Scopes fine. While movies such as Inherit the Wind and textbooks such as those quoted here all suggest that the anti-evolution movement died at Dayton, in fact, the leading evolution textbook at, at issue in the Scopes trial was drastically revised after the trial, and the Quarterly Journal of Biology, reviewing two new biology textbooks introduced in 1929, noted, quote, they have been written with the statutes of Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas in mind, end quote. What did the trial do to Christianity and fundamentalism? Not nearly as much as the historians claimed. American Christianity has always endured ebbs and flows, from the Great Awakening to the Azusa Street Revival, Having just gone through a period of revival from 1900 to 1913, it was normal for the fires of faith to recede some, just as they had in previous eras. World War II also intervened, making measurements of religious fervor in the United States more difficult. But immediately after the war, a new wave of fundamentalists and evangelists packed tents and stadiums, led by a powerful young orator named Billy Graham, whose first large revivals in 1949 in Los Angeles were filled to capacity, lasting eight weeks when they were slated for three. Time featured Graham on its cover the following year. His mission in New York filled Madison Square Garden for 16 weeks. Likewise, Oral Roberts established his evangel evangelistic association in 1947. The, quote, father of the faith movement, end quote, Kenneth Hagan also began his major ministry efforts in 1949, and the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International was established in 1951. By the 1970s, the evolution of, well, evolution had hit some speed bumps. Scientists were less eager to cite evolution as fact, choosing instead to downplay new theories that were in line with an emerging counter, counter view called creation science. Several states have sought to have creationism taught as a theory alongside evolution. Creationism was transformed into a broader theory called intelligent design, to which a considerable number of scientists subscribe. The main difficulty in bringing the debate into classrooms has been that courts label intelligent design as representing a religion and therefore violating the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, even though creationists argue that atheism is itself a religion. Neither fundamentalism nor creationism has, was dealt a permanent blow in the Scopes trial, despite the efforts of reporters and many historians to make it appear so, while nothing can change the now entrenched view that Brian lost the exchanges in Dayton, some efforts have been made to correct the record. Perhaps if Brian becomes enough of a victim, someone will eventually produce an, a remake of Inherit the Wind in which he is portrayed sympathetically. So if you've never heard of um, creation science and intelligent design um, the main idea is they're trying to use science and the scientific methods to prove creationism both of them are um, even though they they have slightly different uh, methods of doing it intelligent design says there's no way that we could have evolved without some help that's the gist of it. So they use the eye as an example to say that there's absolutely no way that our eyes could have evolved just by random, that they had to have been designed in order for all the pieces to fit together the way they do for our eyes to work. Um, the argument against that is that we can see all kinds of... Um, evolutionary steps in eyes from photosynth 
sen- photosensitive spots to eyes that are better than ours and pretty much everything in between. Um, I'll leave that up to you, whether it's true or not. Um, create creation science is a lot the same kind of stuff. Um, from what I remember, it's been a long time since I studied it, but, um, it's basically saying that if you go through and study the Bible, especially Genesis, um, in detail, you'll find all of the, um, steps that science says we would have had to go through for evolution within it. And uh, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember that one as well as I remember intelligent design because it's been like 20 years since I studied it. But there's actually, if I remember right, there's actually a there's a creationist museum. There's also an intelligent design museum somewhere back east of me. I'm in, you know, Montana, so um, somewhere back that direction. Um, there's uh, museums of that that sort. Um, I'd have to look them up again though. Now, now, anyway, moving on. Lie number twenty six. The 1950s were dull and boring and created a generation of conformists in the workplace and home. Okay. Another one I've never heard of. And this one starts off with two quotes. Increasing conformity in middle class business and corporate life was mirrored in the middle class home. Women were to forget any thoughts of continuing their own careers. That's by John Brown Tyndall and David E. Shee, America, A Narrative History. And the second one is modern mass society, some writers worried, inevitably produced loneliness and anxiety, causing mankind to yearn for stability and authority, not freedom. That's by Eric Foner, Give Me Liberty. That actually, he could be talking about at 2024 America in that quote. So many people want stability and safety, and they don't care about being free in any way, shape, or form. All right, this one's only just over three pages, so... Here we go. Perhaps Hollywood, and television in particular, had as much to do as historians with developing this myth that the 1950s were full of cookie cutter homes with no tensions and no rebels. Ironically, no television show had more of an impact on how we viewed the 1950s than a show that was aired from 74, 1974 to 1984, Happy Days. That series featuring a teenage Ron Howard as Richie Cunningham, a typical 1950s high school student, along with the token rebel, the Fonz, Arthur Fonzarelli, played by Henry Winkler, portrayed the decade as happy-go-lucky. Problems consisted of little more than apologizing for toilet papering a principal's yard or learning to roller skate. Racial issues were almost non-existent, although the original owner of the diner that served as the main hangout in the show was Japanese, Pat Morita. On a superficial level, the series seemed to confirm the social critics' darker views of the 1950s, that corporate America had created a population of lonely, career-driven, uncaring robots. Such analysts included William White, the Organization Man, 1956, Sloan Wilson, The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, 1955, and David Reisman, The Lonely Crowd, 1950, along with critics of consumerism such as Vance Packard, The Hidden Persuaders, 1957, who argued that advertisers had subtly programmed Americans to purchase what they instructed through marketing. Add to this the views of C. Wright 
mills that a power elite ran the nation and that ordinary citizens were virtually subjects and you pretty much have the traditional view of the 1950s and the 2020s. The real story of the 1950s, however, is different and quite logical. A series of Cold War related news stories in the late 1940s and early 1950s convinced many Americans that not only was the threat of communism real, it was imminent. The Soviets exploded their own atomic bomb in 1949 and China went communist that same year. Spies such as the Rosenbergs and Klaus Fuchs demonstrated that the U.S. government's most important secrets had been compromised and congressional investigations, topped by Joseph McCarthy's famous list, exposed the presence of numerous hardcore communists inside the U.S. government. Atomic Armageddon seemed a real possibility. North Korea's invasion of South Korea heightened tensions even more, and while foreign policy concerns constituted a serious weight on the minds of Americans, the slow emergence of blacks into mainstream society provided another source of tension. Radical, almost revolutionary forces were already at work in society, a point admitted even by Tyndall and Xi, who, after haranguing students with how sexist American society was in the 1950s, concede that, quote, Overall, the percentage of women working outside the home increased in the 1950s, end quote. In fact, Americans well understood the threats, both to national survival posed by Soviet bombers and to domestic tranquility posed by a, in their view, probably inevitable and necessary civil rights movement. These were dy dynamics of upheaval, and the citizens recognized them as such. Another factor that fostered uncertainty was welcomed by consumers, the automobile. Car production had shot up after World War II, making the United States the most motorized society on Earth. Some 60% of all American households owned a car, and Detroit's automakers outproduced every other nation on Earth combined in auto production. In 1955 alone, U.S. car makers made 9 million cars, or more than four times the number turned out by Germany, France, Italy, and Canada put together. Even before the war, Americans had a ratio of one car to every 4.4 people, compared to one per 137 in Italy. The omnipresence of the automobile introduced a freedom of movement unseen in human history. Not only did people travel to work and local re recreations, but for the first time, car vacations and long-term job relocation were feasible. After the 1956 National Highway Act was passed, highway driving rose 400%. As Northerners moved south, Southerners moved west, and Westerners moved east, new cuisines, lifestyles, activities, and above all, surroundings confronted people at every turn. They handled such upheaval, but clearly a demand existed for familiarity and routine. At the very time that McDonald's appeared, offering the same menu anywhere in the country, the nation's eating establishments were diversifying as never before, offering the most varied menus in history. Travel exposed people to quote-unquote rat holes and dives, prompting Kemmons Wilson to create his Holiday Inn chain with its reputation for sameness and a certain degree of quality. When people moved all around for jobs and excitement, Top 40 Radio reassured them with a list of recognizable music. Even Walt Disney, as he developed his famous theme parks, appreciated the need for a Main Street, where people would instantly feel comfortable no matter where they were from. A bubbling upheaval underneath middle-class society was calmed by these conventions and traditions on the surface. Churches became bland, losing most of the evangelical fire that had led to the great revivals of previous centuries. One major exception was Billy Graham, whose revivals swept the nation. 
Denominations grew less contentious, making it easier to live next to people of different faiths. In art, where the critics celebrated the rebellious avant-garde style of Andy Warhol, Americans preferred overwhelmingly the paintings of Norman Rockwell, truly America's artist. So-called average Americans had witnessed a stunning surge in purchasing power since the Great Depression and the forced savings of World War II. Armed with savings and new forms of credit, Americans caused a housing and consumer explosion, bringing with it its own anxieties and pressures. The quote-unquote cookie-cutter houses of Levi Town or Levitt Levit Town, New York, there are two T's there, Levitt Town, New York, so superficially similar and un non-threatening constituted a massive leap of faith in the American system for millions of homeowners who, for the first time, had substantial debt, but also substantial property. For the first time in the post sod buster era, where people built their own houses, Americans purchased pre-made housing by incurring debt. While in many ways the baby boomers born in the 1950s would produce some of our least impressive leaders in government and the arts, the adults of the 1950s included some of the nation's greatest achievers, including Walt Disney, Ronald Reagan, Lee, Lee Iacocca, Lyndon Johnson, George H.W. Bush, Bob Hope, John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, Charles Lindbergh, Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, Joe DiMaggio, Ann Landers, Catherine Hepburn, Sidney Poitier, Walter Cronkite, Ray Kroc, and Kemmons Wilson. Their artistic and literary endeavors included movies such as Lady and the Tramp and Bambi, television shows such as The Honeymooners and I Love Lucy, music such as Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story, and books such as Herman Woke's Kane Kane Mutiny and Ayn Rand's Ayn Rand's I've never known how to pronounce that first one uh, her first name Atlas Shrugged Affordable yeah uh, anyway, um, affordable airline travel appeared and the fast food industries were born during the 1950s. Rock and roll changed not only American musical tastes, but those throughout the world. And jazz and country music established themselves as two other American-originated mainstream music styles. The perceived sameness and conformity so many historians have noted in the 1950s was a necessary anchor to the phenomenal churning and dying dynamism of American society. Most Americans understood what was going on in their world and steadied themselves through the familiar while enabling and even encouraging the radical changes underway. The calm waters of 1950s happy days masked a submerged tsunami that would crash ashore in the next decade. And that is... The end of the 1950s were dull and boring. So, I'm going to do one more. Yeah, I'm going to do one more. That'll be four, and that'll be enough for tonight. Um, Richard Nixon, so this is number 27. Richard Nixon sent burglars into the West Gate office complex. Watergate, sorry. I don't know why I read, read that as Westgate. I know it's Watergate. Into the Watergate office complex. So, two quotes. Through his approval of the plumber's unit, quote-unquote, Nixon certainly authorized the break-in. And that's by David E. Harrell et al., Unto a Good Land. The second one is, the Watergate tapes also proved that Nixon had not only known about plans to cover up the Watergate break-in, but had also ordered it. And that is by John Mac Farragher et al., out of many. Okay. If historians hate Ronald Reagan, their contempt for Richard Nixon is even greater. 
A concise history of the American Republic began its section on Nixon by noting that Lyndon Johnson turned over the office to a to quote a successor known neither for his imagination nor his scruples end quote, and that Nixon was quote unquote long thought of as a born loser. Unto a good land, reasonably fair in its treatment of Nixon, nevertheless informs its readers that he was quote crude and shrewd and deeply embittered against the accumulated enemies of a lifetime, end quote. It is also accepted as conventional wisdom that Nixon himself orchestrated the May 28th and June 16th burglaries of the Watergate office complex in 1972. That's a fact I never knew. I never knew there were two. I always thought there was just the one. Wow, you learn something every day. But to this day, the objective of the break-ins remains a source of contention. What did Nixon hope to gain by breaking into the Democratic National Committee's headquarters? The movie Hoax with Richard Gere centers the break-ins around a diary that was going to reveal substantial illegal payments from Howard Hughes to Nixon. According to the film, Nixon ordered the Watergate break-ins to obtain a copy of this non-existent diary before the Democrats got it. Little attention, if any, is paid in textbooks to the theory that the burglaries were the brainchild of Nixon's own White House counsel, John Dean, who went on to reinvent himself as a moral critic of Republican, Republicans and was made a second, has made a second career out of writing books bashing conservatives. Dean denied that he was the mastermind. To vindicate his name, he brought suit against the publisher and authors of Silent Coup, an explosive book about Watergate, and against G. Gordon Liddy. Under John Mitchell, former attorney general and head of the committee to re-elect the president, unfortunately referred to as Creep. Okay, yeah. A special investigative group was in place before the Watergate break-ins, staffed by political operatives skilled in quote-unquote opposition research. One of those operatives was G. Gordon Liddy, who reported to Mitchell, according to sworn testimony given by Liddy in Dean's lawsuit against Liddy, in November 1971, John Dean summoned Liddy and offered him a budget of a quote-unquote, half million dollars for openers, to direct a whole range of surveillance activities on the Democrats. Liddy replied that it would take double that amount. Dean Liddy said, Dean, Liddy said, was the, quote-unquote, clearinghouse for the activities. Liddy was introduced to the president's inner circle as the one, quote-unquote, in charge of dirty tricks. Liddy proceeded to outline a program called Gemstone, on January 27, 1972, with Dean and Mitchell present. At that point, Liddy maintained the Democratic National Committee, DNC, headquarters was not a target. It was several months later, around the end of May 1972, when Jeb Magruder, who managed the CRP, instructed Liddy to gain access to the DNC on, quote-unquote, Northern Avenue Southwest. Northern. Where did I get? Oh, I hate it when my brain does that. You're going to laugh when you hear the word that I substituted Northern for. It actually says Virginia Avenue Southwest. Where the fuck did Northern come from? <sighs> and find out what was instead inside the office of the DNC chairman, Larry O'Brien. What? I don't, I don't understand that sentence. Liddy, quote, could tell this was not Magruder's idea. He was relaying instructions, end quote. Moreover, Liddy said in sworn testimony that he had been, quote, recruited by Mr. Dean to organize and deploy an intelligence capability, end quote. Contrary to the widely believed idea that Liddy's team bugged O'Brien's phone, Liddy claims that the target of the break-ins was instead the desk area of R. Spencer Oliver and his secretary, Ida Maxie Wells. But why? Oliver was in charge of the Democratic state chair. 
what could be the purpose of investigating him. Liddy testified under oath that, quote, there was no call ever purportedly made from Lawrence O'Brien or from Lawrence O'Brien or by Lawrence O'Brien, end quote. However, most sources re support this conclusion that, in fact, photos of DNC documents were taken and that they were handed over to Jeb Magruder. The transmissions were intercepted by a receiver in the Howard Johnson Hotel across the street, and Liddy became even more frustrated that there was little useful political material being material being generated at all nor was he shown the photographs that were taken e howard hunt who kept detailed notebooks on the watergate affair found when he was being prosecuted that all materials he could have used to construct a defense were missing In their book, Silent Coup, The Removal of a President, published in 1991, Len Kolodny and Robert Getlin argued that the break-in originated with Dean and involved his personal concerns, not political dirty tricks. As Liddy testified that, quote, meant to me that what he, Magruder, wanted was the whatever there would be be of a derogatory nature about us that the Democrats might have, end quote. Therefore, when Jeb Magruder told Liddy he wanted to know what Lawrence O'Brien was had in his top drawer, the same place Magruder kept his own political dirt, it could have referred to political material, or if Kolodny and Getlin are right, it could have referred to entirely personal material sought by Dean. What people generally refer to as the Watergate, Watergate break-in occurred on the night of June 16, 1972, and it was actually the second of two break-ins. The one intended to remove a re reposition or reposition, reposition? Oh, 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 re... <laughs> I love it when I do that. The one intended to remove or reposition the bugs and to get more photos. When arrested that night, one of the burglars produced a key to Maxie Wells' desk. Since Wells was not even the secretary for O'Brien, but worked in Oliver's area, the objective of the break-in became even more puzzling. Indeed, in his book, Will... Liddy stated that the purpose of the second break-in was to learn what the Democrats had, quote, of a derogatory nature on us, not for us to get something on O'Brien or the Democrats, end quote. Both Silent Coup and a subsequent investigative report aired on the A&E network alleged that the break-in was a quest for information about a prostitution ring. Gordon Liddy made the same claims and as and as in Silent Coup alleged that John Dean's wife Maureen was linked to the ring. The Deans brought a lawsuit against the authors and publisher of Silent Coup and against Liddy which was ultimately settled out of court. In 1996 Liddy offered many days worth of d deposed testimony in which he recounted his story. This was an important counterbalance to the historians who had up until that time relied almost exclusively on Dean's version of Watergate, as put forth in his 1976 book, Blind Ambition. But the more important lawsuit involved a $5.1 million action brought by Maxie Wells against Liddy for slander and defamation of character. This was thrown out of court in 1998, but the 4th U.S. Court of Appeals reinstated it. In 2001, it was again dismissed when a jury could not reach a verdict. Liddy, although celebrating the dismissals as a victory, repeatedly told the press that he craved a trial. In her suit, Wells claimed that Liddy had defamed her by saying that her desk contained photographs of the call girls, but the jury didn't buy the defamation allegation. One 
juror Riley noted, quote, I don't feel you can defame a desk or a phone, end quote. When asked under oath about Dean, Liddy said, quote, Sir, as I have said before, and I will repeat until my dying day, the man is a serial perjurer, end quote. Even the FBI agreed that John Dean was the, quote, master manipulator of the cover-up, end quote. But once Howard Hunt's notebooks were destroyed, the main documentary evidence linking him with the burglary was gone. Even after Dean's participation became clear and he turned state's evidence, his exposure as the central figure in the break-in was limited. Dean was sentenced to one to four years in jail, but spent only a few months in a special safe house facility. When Dean was sentenced, quote-unquote, hanging judge, John Sirica adjusted his sentence to time served. Liddy, on the other hand, who refused to roll over on his fellow conspirators, was sentenced to 20 years and served four and a half before President Jimmy Carter commuted the sentence. The official story perpetuated by Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein in All the President's Men, and the one basically endorsed by the Democratic Dom dominated Watergate committee was that Nixon, through his aides, had ordered the burglary out of paranoia and then tried to cover it up. The reality is quite different. Nixon claimed his first knowledge of any part of the affair came while he was in Florida on June 17th. Then he was briefed bit by bit until on June 20th, H.R. Bob Haldeman came to him with the news that Liddy had done it. Nixon was told there had been a break-in, but not the nature or purpose of it. In fact, Nixon's response in his memoirs, R.N. was, quote, I heard many other theories about the reason for the break-in and bugging of the DNC. I heard so many different stories because I asked the same question so many times. Why bug the DNC? Emphasis in original. On Monday, June 19th, after furious shredding of documents the previous day, Liddy went to the White House where he was met by Dean. Quote, there is one thing I've got to know right away, Dean said. Did anybody in the White House, are they aware of what you were doing, that you were going in there? End quote. Objective observers could infer from that question two things, that Dean was genuinely interested in knowing if the president had knowledge of the purpose of the break-in or just the opposite, that he had known that the purposes, what the purposes were and wanted to make certain no one else knew. At any rate, Liddy, realizing what he knew, could topple Nixon, offered to, quote, go stand on a street corner while somebody shoots me, end quote. But according to Liddy, Dean replied, quote, I don't think we have gotten there yet. End quote. When told Nixon, when told Nixon immediately thought Mitchell was involved for Liddy worked for Mitchell in the committee to reelect the president. When Dean met with Nixon and Haldeman, on June 23, 1972, which produced the famous quote-unquote smoking gun tape incriminating Nixon for knowing about the break-in, Dean had already convinced Haldeman that he had John Mitchell's blessings to, call, to use the CIA to block further FBI probing. Nixon told Haldeman to claim that it would impinge on national security and to invoke the CIA to stop the FBI probe. It is clear that Nixon's memoir, from Nixon's memoirs, that he was amenable to this and that he did not have to be prodded in the least to contain the investigation. There it was. Nixon conspired to obstruct justice by having the CIA stop the FBI investigation. What was not known at the time, and certainly the Nixon-obsessed Watergate committee and media then were not going to entertain, was whether the president was set up by Dean, who played on Nixon's paranoia to 
drag the president into the plot. Nixon was absolutely guilty of conspiracy, but was it after the fact? Dean's inability and anyone else's to challenge Liddy successfully in court is one scoreboard on which to tally the veracity of the different differing claims. The other is evidence provided by Kolodny and Getlin, evidence that, if true, completely overthrows not only the orthodoxy of Nixon, of, quote, Nixon dreamed up the Watergate burglary, end quote, but also lands a crushing blow on the elevated, some would say pompous position of Woodward and Bernstein and the Washington Post. For his part, Nixon is not excused from any of the crimes he did commit, which were eerily similar to the obstruction of justice charges leveled at Bill Clinton nearly 25 years later. In the end, however, Nixon, unlike Clinton, ended up doing the right thing, resigning. And that is the end of that lie number 27. And I don't have it in me to read another one tonight. So the next one will be lie number 28. Neither Ronald Reagan's election nor the contract with America proved the triumph of conservative ideas. That's where we'll, where we'll take off next Friday. And we'll do three or four more. So, all right. What do we got going on here? We've got... Mr. Blitzer is playing Hell Divers 2. So is Zeus would. Um, Zeus has got more people watching than Mr. Blitzer. Biddy6501 is playing something retro. Glock316 is playing Dead Space. I've been kind of thinking about Dead Space. I might just go check that one out. Yeah, let's go to let's go to Glock 316 for um, Dead Space. I will see you over there. Just that's all.